بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علما رب زدني علما رب زدني علما اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا Welcome everyone to this talk on Quran, the timeless miracle Okay uh, Now the way this talk, talk actually came about was uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, Me and Haji Rashid were sitting and talking And as we are talking, we started talking about the miraculous nature of the Quran so he requested that maybe I should give a talk on this particular subject. So I said, Bismillah, it's a great topic to discuss. So that's how the idea of the talk uh, essentially came about. Quran, a timeless miracle, okay? Now, uh, firstly, what exactly is a miracle? What makes a miracle? What constitutes a miracle? And what do we call a mir miracle within the Arabic language? Now, we know within the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal calls the Quran itself an ayah, right? This is in the Qur'an multiple times uh, mentioned about the Qur'an and also the ayat that other prophets have been given as well, right? So we have the ayat that uh, the Prophet Musa, Prophet Isa, all of the prophets of God, all of the messengers of God were given specific ayat that were appropriate for their time, their space, their situation, their context, their people, and whatever their people happened to be best at, right? So this was the ayat of those prophets. Um, and later, the topic of the miracle of the Qur'an, or the miracle in general, the Muslim philosophers in later times, perhaps within the second century, or the early third century, okay? They ended up coining a new term for this idea of miracle, and they called it a mu'jizah, okay? And they said that a mu'jizah has to have a couple of different things. They defined it saying that it has to be a supernatural occurrence, something that is beyond normal. Not normal, but beyond normal. It has to be by means of a messenger. So a messenger is the one who would be doing, you know, who would be bringing about this particular occurrence by the leave, of course, of God, by the idhan or the, by the will of Allah Azza wa Jal, right? And the third thing they said is that it has to be coupled together with a challenge that the Prophet gives, that a Prophet gives to his people, okay? So we have three things then. It has to be a supernatural occurrence, something that is beyond normal, paranormal, okay? And then it has to be with a Prophet or a Messenger. And it has to be coupled together with a challenge that this Prophet gives. This is the, the, the broad definition of a mu'jizah, of a miracle, right? It's applicable to Islam, and it's applicable to other religions as well. How so? We can look at the ayat or the mu'jizat of the previous prophets as well and see if they happen to be supernatural occurrences like the occurrences that happened to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ya naru kuni bardan wa salaman ala Ibrahim. O fire, become coolness and ease and peace for Ibrahim alayhi salam. So this was a supernatural occurrence. And it happened to a by means of a messenger and not just that, he made the claim that I am a messenger, this is the challenge that I'm giving you, bring something of its nature, okay? So, the first few minutes are gonna be a little bit technical and after that I'm going to start getting into examples ta'ala and everything insha'Allah ta'ala will start to fall into place. But we need to get into those technicalities in order for us to then really understand the examples, okay? So the first thing is what? That it has to be a paranormal or supernatural occurrence. Okay, so that means that all normal events cannot be deemed miraculous. This is very important because many, many times, even us Muslims, we look at something that is absolutely normal, perhaps even within our religion, and we become, uh, you know, we say, Subhanallah, this is so, this is the miracle of the Quran, or this is the miracle of the Prophet. ﷺ. The Prophet told us of this 1400 years ago, perhaps there was record of it even prior to 1400 years ago, right? So it has to be something that is extra normal. That is what amazes people. And that is what can be a proof that someone happened to be a, an apostle of God or a prophet of God, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is, the second condition is that a challenge must be placed for, forward. 
We know that all of the prophets or many of the prophets and many of the messengers, they would come to their people. For instance, Isa alayhi salam, he said, Allah said, وَرَسُولًا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ Allah had sent him as a messenger to the Israelites. What did he say? أَنِّي قَدْ جِئْتُكُمْ بِآيَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ I have come to you, to you with a sign from your Lord. أَنِّي قَدْ جِئْتُكُمْ بِآيَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ I have come to you with a sign from, from your Lord. Okay? So here's a sign, a prophet proclaiming that I have a sign and challenging his people that I have a sign. And then he gives them a long list of signs that Isa alayhi salam was given. Now of course, this is not the topic of our discussion, so we'll keep going, right? But Isa alayhi salam at that point, he gave a lot of signs about why he is in fact a prophet to the Israelites, right? So the second thing then is that there has to be a challenge. This challenge can be implied or it can be explicit. So the Prophet ﷺ was given a clear, explicit challenge, which is the Qur'an, and he was given a plethora of implied challenges, okay? Some of the scholars, they said that the, that the mu'jizat of the Prophet ﷺ are over 1,000 mu'jizat, okay? Whether that number is an exaggeration or not, we know that there are really many, many mu'jizat of the Prophet ﷺ, and I collected a small book in which I gathered around 60-odd Miracles of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there are many, okay? But the point is that the one which happens to be with a challenge is of course the Qur'an. The others, they're called Dala'ilun Nubuwa. They're called proofs of prophethood, but they may not be, uh, from a semantical perspective, they may not be referred to as mu'jizat, okay? According to some. But anyways, the point is all of them prove that this was a messenger because something supernatural is occurring at the hands of this messenger, okay? The fourth thing, and this is very important, the mu'jiza should occur just as the claimant made the claim, okay? So if a, if a person says that I'm going to, for instance, uh, spit inside of this well, and the well will then start to gush with water, okay? And when he spits in this, inside of this well, the well becomes completely dry. And this is exactly what happened to an imposter prophet at the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, by the name of Musaylima al kathab because they went to him and they said to him that you are a prophet of God. Some of the people who believed in his prophet, he was an imposter, right? And the prophet titled him al kathab So they said to him, "We have a well; it's starting to dry, and we're afraid that it's going to completely dry." So he said, "Okay, I will take some of that water. I put it in my mouth, and I'll spit in it, and it will become." Uh, lots of water, right? And the water will start to increase. But subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa Jal made his attempt to gain a mu'jiza, what they call an ihana, a humiliation, right? So technically anything that comes against the claim of the claimant is called ihana. And similarly, the same person, one day some people came to him and they brought a child who, whose hair was falling off. So they said to him that uh, we want you to take your blessed hand and we want you to rub it over, your, over the child's head. Perhaps Allah will bring about the hair of this child. So he said, okay. I mean, he was deluded by his own lies. So he took his hand and he started wiping it on top of this child and the hair, all of them, they started to fall off. Okay? So this is again an ihana. So this is, of course, not a mu'jiza. Why? Even though something supernatural. It's not natural for someone to spit, spit in a well and the well becomes dry. It's not natural for someone to wipe someone's head and then the hair start to fall off. So it's supernatural, but it is against the claim of the claimant. He's saying, I'm a prophet and I'm going to do this and it'll get fixed and the opposite happens. So Allah is showing the people that this person is actually an imposter. Okay? And last but not least, uh, the, the, and this is the fifth condition, the, the man who has made that uh, claim to a miracle must also make a claim to prophethood because there are people even within the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who will get what we can call in english we can call them miracles okay they're called karamat in arabic but we but from a from a technical perspective we don't call them miracles because we we use the term miracle specifically to the prophets right basically what that means is they'll get something supernatural as an honor for their righteousness within this world. The Sunni creed is that the pious amidst the ummah may be granted al-karamat. They call it karamatul awliya. Okay? 
And this is something we have great records of within history from the time of the Tabi'een, rather from the time of the Sahaba downwards till the later generations. Okay? Some of those karamat were similar to the mu'jizat that were given to the prophets themselves. For instance, uh, we know that Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah azza wa jal made the fire cool for him, right? Abu, Musa, uh, Abu Muslim al-Khawalani was also among the people within our ummah for whom Allah azza wa jal made the fire cool. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, when he met him, he embraced him and he said, uh, you know, he was so glad that he met a person from amongst the ummah of Muhammad who was given the same supernatural occurrence that happened to Ibrahim alayhi salam. But no claim of prophethood was there. So then obviously this person is not a prophet, right? So supernatural occurrences can be categorized in multiple different uh, ways. Okay, even till today we sometimes see people going through supernatural occurrences for different reasons. Sometimes for istidraj, sometimes for ihana, sometimes for karama, sometimes uh, and, and so forth, right? Now let's try taking all of this information and applying it to the Qur'an. Let's apply all of this to the Qur'an. Is it really true that the Qur'an happens to be a paranormal or a supernatural occurrence? Was there ever a challenge that occurred from the Qur'an or from Allah's Prophet wasallam, telling the people, this is my, this is my mu'jiza to you, this is my miracle to you? Okay, firstly, was the Qur'an something supernatural? Now we know that the Qur'an which is recorded in masahif all across the world, it rests on bookshelves like these ones right here, just as other books rest on bookshelves as well. So one may assume that it is not actually a supernatural occurrence. Why? Because we have it right before us, right? But the way we know that the Qur'an is in fact a supernatural occurrence is if we look at the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had addressed the pagans of that time within the Qur'an. So when the pagans first heard about this Qur'an, the first thing that, they hap that happened to them was they felt immediately that they cannot replicate this. Why not? Okay? Why not? Uh, to understand this, I need to tell you two things, okay? The first thing is there's something called manzoom. And then there's something called manthur. Okay, there's something called, uh, there's something which is poetic and there's something which is normal writing, okay? Now, normally poetry has a certain meter by which it, you know, rhymes, okay? So it rhymes in a certain way and Arabs have 16 odd different meters that they use to calculate the rhymes of things, okay? And I write poetry in Arabic so I am aware of these meters, okay? So. That's the first thing. And the second thing is just normal writing. Normally, normal writing doesn't come with a melodious rhyme that poetry comes with. However, poetry is captivating in that it all sounds rhythmic, right? So you have rhyme on one end, and then you have regular writing on the other end. Quran comes and it brings the two and it mixes the two in a very, very captivating way where there is no pattern. If you look at the Qur'an, throughout the Qur'an, you will never be able to pinpoint a specific pattern. By the way, not even within certain surah. You will not be able to find specific patterns in the way things are rhyming, but they're all rhythmic. And that's why when people hear the Qur'an, they become, you know, uh, dumbstruck, dumbfounded. They become uh, awestruck because of how beauty, beautiful and how melodious the Qur'an is. But there happens to be no single pattern that the entire Qur'an uses. Because the Arabs in this very, very specific patterns, one vowel here, one vowel there, and you've messed up the patterns. That's how they used to write poetry at that time. Mustaf'ilun, 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 fa'ulun, mafa'ilun, fa'ulun, mafa'ilu, mufa'alatun, mufa'alatun, fa'ulu. Everything happens to have a specific pattern. One letter this way, one letter that way, one vowel this way, one vowel that way, that's it. The poetry has fallen apart. But the Qur'an has no pattern whatsoever, and yet it sounds more melodious than poetry, okay? And on top of that, it happens to be regular writing, but still it has all of the, all of the features of poetry as well. In addition to that, poetic language normally has a problem, and that is that a poet can be very, very fluent, and very, very eloquent, and so on and so forth, but at the end of the day, because of the meters, he gets stuck 
and he can't express himself to the best of his ability. Allah Azza wa Jal inculcates all of the features of this poet poetry in terms of its rhythm, in terms of its beauty. But Allah Azza wa Jal places every single word, as we'll find out today, in a very, very specific way in what we call the epitome of eloquence. And by the way, Muslims and non-Muslims alike who happen to be Arabic literaries admit that the Qur'an happens to be the epitome of what they know to be literature within the Arabic language. We believe that it is the epitome of literature in every language and we have reasons for that. So the Arabs immediately they realized that this is not something that they can do, right? So then they started to accuse the Prophet ﷺ of fabricating and concocting this Qur'an. So Allah Azza wa Jal, He replied to them. And He said, وَمَا كَانَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ أَنْ يُفْتَرَى مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ This Qur'an couldn't have been fabricated, it couldn't have come from anyone other than Allah Azza wa Jal. So this response, this was the first, now there's going to be a dialogue, basically. There's a pattern of thought that occurred in order to finally uh, the final challenge, the final i'jaz, the final tahaddi, the final challenge to come to the Arabs. What is that final challenge? I'm getting to that. But there's a chronological order of discussion that took place between Allah Azza wa Jal and the pagan Arabs of that time. Right? So the first thing is a simple, the Qur'an is fabricated. Allah says the Qur'an is not fabricated. Now, the second step that takes place is that they try to explain away the Qur'an by saying it is poetry, even though they know. The smarter ones, I miss them, they say, we know poetry and this is not poetry. Right? In the private quarters, they would say, we know, this is, we know poetry and this is nothing like poetry, so it cannot be poetry. Okay? Jami. So, they say, Sha'ir. They say, then they say, okay, you know what? He's a magician. Some of them, they come back and they say, you know what? It cannot be a magician as well. Uh, Let's at least call him a liar or something like that, right? وَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ هَذَا سَاحِرٌ كَذَّابٌ The kuffar of Quraysh, they said that this person happens to be a sahir, he happens to be a magician, and he happens to be a liar as well, right? أَفْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا أَمْ بِهِ جِنَّةً Now they're starting to say that he happens to be majnoon, he's gone mad. صلى الله عليه وسلم They keep going and Allah Azza wa is going to give them a response for each of these in a very, very direct way, in a very, very clear way. Then they go and they say, again, he's fabricating, they keep on going back to the same lies. He's fabricating, he's doing this, he's a liar, he happens to be a magician, he's a sha'ir. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look, if all of that is true, he happens to be a liar, he happens to be a poet, he happens to be majnoon, then I'm surely you have poets who are known poets from amidst the society, bring one of them, he can develop something like this. They're not able to do that. If he's a liar, lie like him and show us your lies. They're not able to do that. If he's crazy, bring one of your fools and see what he does and says. He's not able to, do, they're not able to do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلْيَأْتُوا بِحَدِيثٍ مِثْلِهِ إِنْ كَانُوا صَادِقِينَ Then let them bring something of speech like it, if they happen to be truly truthful to the claim that they're making. But now this, now the challenge is beginning. Now bring us something like the Qur'an, right? But they want to forego this challenge. And sometimes when people are challenged beyond their scope, they try to forego the challenge by saying, this challenge is under me, beneath me, right? So they start to go down this route. وَإِذَا تُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُنَا When our ayat are recited upon them, قَالُوا قَدْ سَمِعْنَا لَوْ نَشَاءُ لَقُلْنَا مِثْلَ هَذَا We've heard the challenge. If we wish, we could have said something entirely of its like as well. In هَذَا إِلَّا أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ This is nothing more than fables and tales of the past people. Right? So they want to try to forego this challenge by saying, this is just a simple challenge. If we wish, we can do that. But Allah Azza wa Jal, when they go to this point, now they're saying, this is a simple challenge. We can do that if we so please. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلَّ إِنِ اجْتَمَعَتِ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنُّ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لَا يَأْتُونَا بِمِثْلِهِ وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ ظَهِيرًا Say, O Muhammad, if all of mankind and all of jinkind were to come together and they were to attempt to bring something like this Qur'an, they would never be able to do that even if all of them gathered together to attempt to do that. They would never ever be able to do that. Okay? 
So now Allah is giving them this daunting challenge to bring the entire, the likes of the entire Qur'an. So they start to play the games as well. What do they say now? They say, you know what? The information within the Qur'an is such that Quraysh doesn't have it. He met people in Asham, he met people here in his travels, and he ended up writing down this information from them. And that is what he's narrating on to the people. They say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes, وَقَالُوا أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ They say that it is just the fables of the early people. اِكْتَتَبَهَا فَهِيَ تُمْلَى عَلَيْهِ بُكْرَةً وَأَصِيلًا He ended up writing them down and they are being dictated to him morning and night time. So it's as if he's taking the information from someone else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't let them go on this as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمْ We know of a surety. أَنَّهُمْ يَقُولُونَ إِنَّمَا يُعَلِّمُهُ بَشَرٌ They say that there's no one teaching him except a man. It's not an angel bringing wahi, it's just a man teaching him. لِسَانُ الَّذِي يُلْحِدُونَ إِلَيْهِ أَعْجَمِيُونَ وَهَذَا لِسَانٌ عَرَبِيُّ مُبِينَ The tongue that they try to point to, it happens to be أَعْجَمِي It happens to be a foreign tongue that doesn't know how to speak Arabic. But this happens to be explicit, clear, eloquent Arabic. How can a person of that you know, genre, a person who's not Arab, bring something like this. Again, they're stumped. Again, they're stuck. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes it a bit easier on them because they go back to the same claims. They said, the information we don't have, they, he's a sahir, he's a kathab, he's So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Am Are they still saying that he happens to be fabricating? Right? قُلْ فَأْتُوا بِعَشْرِ سُوَرٍ مِثْلِهِ مُفْتَرَيَاتِ Then bring to me just ten surahs of its like, مُفْتَرَيَاتِ which you end up fabricating on your own, just as he, as you claim, had fabricated the Qur'an. Just bring me ten, he's brought you 114, you just bring me ten. And he continues to bring you on a daily basis. And then you say there's someone helping him, right? وَدْعُوا مَنْ اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ You claim that there's other people helping him as well, وَدْعُوا مَنِ اسْتَطَعْتُمْ Call whoever you so please, other than Allah Azza wa Jal, if you so happen to be truthful. Right? Call everyone. Gather the entire people. You think he went to Sham? You have people that went to Sham. You think he went there, here? You think there's someone non-Arab that is speaking to him that has information and tales and fables from India and other places? You have all that as well. So go ahead and bring everyone together and still you will surely and definitely fail. Now they're stumped and they're stuck, so Allah Azza wa Jal wants to perfect the challenge. And the last challenge, and this is what the challenge of the Qur'an stuck at till the Day of Judgment and it continues to remain. يَقُولُونَ افْتَرَاهُ أَمْ يَقُولُونَ افْتَرَاهُ they, Do they say that he has fabricated? Then do what? فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِثْلِهِ Just bring one surah like the Qur'an. One surah. And we know that the shortest surah of the Qur'an is what? It's three ayat with the exclusion of of Al-Basmalah, okay? And it happens to be just 10 odd words. So Allah Azza wa Jal is saying that bring me just 10 words. Now one may say, don't the Arabs know all of these words? We say the Quran is revealed in Arabic, so the Arabs can obviously put together a sentence. It's not about how, what sentence they put together and the words that they know. It's about how you use those words. You and I all know the, you know, the different words out there, but literary experts have a different way of writing. True literaries have a different way of writing literature and they're able to bring something that you and I, despite the fact that we know the same words, cannot bring. Allah Azza wa Jal placed within the shortest surah of the Qur'an. And that happens to be Surah Al-Kawthar. Allah placed within that so many rhetorical instruments that no other person within this world can place such rhetorical beauty within just 10 words, okay? And I have online a lecture on Surah Al-Kawthar, uh, about an hour long. I can't get into Surah Al-Kawthar itself because that is, uh, that, that would take a long time because every single, literally every single letter you stop at and you think and there's some meaning within it. And there's something to, to think uh, about within that. So you can inshallah look that up uh, and you'll find uh, within that, inshallah, some khair when it comes to the i'jaz that Allah has placed within within the surah. And I don't claim that the lecture entails everything because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Quran is beyond the, uh, one talk or one you know, lecture or even a series entailing everything within it from the mu'jizat. Okay? Now the third part. So the first two questions are answered. There was a challenge. There was in fact a challenge. And uh, there was 
a mu'jiza. The Quran is in fact supernatural. Was there anyone who fulfilled this challenge? That's the second question, okay? Is there anyone out there who ended up fulfilling the challenge of trying to bring about something like the Quran or 10 surahs like the Quran or the final challenge and that is just one surah uh, like the Quran. By the way, there's no challenge in the Quran that says one ayah. Keep that in mind. Sometimes people, when they get carried away, they say one ayah. No, Allah Azza wa Jal, the bare minimum challenge that He made is one surah. Because a surah has its own personality. Okay? So who can write a chapter, be it very small, that has a complete personality to itself that it carries a, a deep meaning within it. Okay? So, was there anyone who was able to bring something like the Quran? Three ayat, ten words, or something of that nature. We have 1440 odd years, and we're still running. Until today, there hasn't been a single person who's been successfully able to bring something that is of literary excellence par up to the Quran, that pars up to the Quran. Now, one may say, you know, that might be subject, that might be a subjective claim. But the reality is that, you know, if we think about literary experts within the world, there has been Arabic literary experts who are Arabs, born and bred, but they, they're not Muslims. Okay, even till today. You know, I don't want to mention any names to promote people who are, uh, who happen to be that way, but there are names till today of people who happen to be literary experts, people whose books are studied in even sometimes, believe it or not, Kulliyat al Sharia or, or Kulliyat al Lugha. The, Colleges of Arabic language that happen to be non-Muslims and they're here till today. Okay? Books that you would be shocked at when you look at the excellence of how this person happens to be a writer on Nahu or Sarf or Balagha or so on and so forth. And specifically have a name in mind who happens to be Christian. Okay? But, and they use by the way ayat Qur'aniya when they're, when they're writing their books on grammar as well. Because they know that even non-Muslim experts of the Arabic language know that there is nothing beyond the Qur'an when it comes to the excellence in language. Okay? So, till today, there hasn't been a single person who's, been, who's rightfully made a claim that they've brought something like the Qur'an. Not a single person. Okay? Was there ever such a claim in the past? Uh, sorry, was there a claim to prophethood? Of course, we know that there was a claim to prophethood right from the beginning. When the Prophet ﷺ made his call right in the beginning, he went up onto uh, the Jabal, the mountain, and then he screamed, Ya Sabaha, Wa Sabaha, uh, Oh, uh, destruction uh, may afflict in the morning time, and so on and so forth. Quraysh gathered together, he told them, do you, What do you say if I were to tell you that there happens to be an army right behind me on this mountain? Right? Safa. And they said, we will accept you, your claim, because you happen to be truthful and we know that you're standing in a position that you can see we cannot, right? So he said, فَإِنِّي نَذِيرٌ لَكُمْ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ عَذَابٍ شَدِيدٌ Then I happen to be a warner to you for a punishment that happens to be very severe. So from the very get-go, from the very beginning, the Prophet ﷺ, he gave this challenge or he told the people that he happens to be a prophet, a warner, right? And there's so many other examples of where the Prophet ﷺ told. So everybody knows the Prophet ﷺ had proclaimed prophethood, right? Now, the question is, how do we know that this is in fact a miracle? We said that the Arabs who happened to be the most perfect and eloquent people at that time, right? They were not able to, they were not able to bring something like the Qur'an and throughout the centuries no one was able to. But one may say, I don't speak Arabic, I don't know Arabic, how am I to know? Something is a miracle and something is not a miracle, right? Well, firstly, you can use your intellect and derive that because if we think about the fact that the people who knew their own language best, by the way, Arabic is only considered hujjah that is spoken, it's only considered an evidence within the first 200 odd years, give or take, different scholars have different measurements, right? Okay? So after that, the Arabic has changed to a point where people when they speak Arabic, that is not considered proof in terms of us defining meanings. Arabic is not like English. English is a language that develops consistently. Arabic is a language that doesn't develop consistently. First, is, first of all, it is a language that is based on derivatives. So every time there's a new object, you can make a word 
from within the language. Okay? That is the case also with English to some degree, but it's not as, evidence, as evident as it is within the Arabic language. Okay? Everything is, everything is derived from three or four letter root words. Okay? That's the difference between Arabic and other language, languages. For that reason, you don't add new words to the language. You add new ideas and then the Arabic language forms words within the forms that are already within it. Okay? Now, what do we consider an evidence when it comes to meanings within the Arabic language? Only the first hundred odd years of Islam or pre-Islamic times. Why am I saying this? Because this means that these were the people who knew the language of the Arabs best. And most particularly the people whose language was the most right was the people whom the Prophet ﷺ was sent to. They used to boast about their language. If they were not able to replicate the Qur'an or 10 surahs like the Qur'an or one surah like the Qur'an, then who else will be able to? But nonetheless, we can still see the miracle of the Qur'an in other ways as well. If you use your intellect therein, that's enough of a proof. But let's say you don't want to go that route. We can find and we can ponder the Qur'an ourselves and see that there is in fact uh, very many forms of miracles within the Qur'an. So far, we should have already recognized that the primary type of miracle in the Qur'an is what? The primary type of miracle within the Qur'an is the Arabic miracle, the linguistic miracle, okay? So let's try, let's attempt, okay? Of course, the more Arabic you know, the closer you get to try to recognizing the miraculous nature of the Qur'an from the linguistic angle. But still, if we try to ponder the Qur'an, we can still come to some degree of recognition. We're all people of intellect and intelligent people, isn't that so, right? So I'll give you an example. Firstly, whenever we're trying to perfect a statement, we have to do three things within Arabic, okay? And within other languages as well. Firstly, we have to perfect the uh, word choice, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing that we need to do is we have to perfect, and especially in languages which are based on derivatives, we have to perfect the form that we choose in order for us to express ourselves, okay? That's what they call morphology. The third thing that we have to do is we have to perfect the sentence structure that the sentence is placed in, right? How the sentence has been structured. I can say one thing in multiple different ways, right? That's why when you're writing a book, for example, or you're writing, a, uh, writing anything, you sit there taking the sentence and restructuring it again and again and again to get the perfect meanings that you want, right? So sentences can be structured in many ways. Word choices are many. And forms that you use, especially in languages that are based on derivatives, that they happen to be many as well. So you have to pick all, these, all of these three things. Now the claim is that every single time the Qur'an picks the best word, and it picks the best form, and it picks the best sentence structure as well, okay? Every single time, without exception, okay? And there hasn't been till today anyone who's been able to successfully make a claim that the Qur'an structured a sentence in a way where it rendered a meaning that's good, but there could be a better meaning. Because in that location, in that particular context, the way Allah Azza wa Jal had structured, that is in fact the best, okay? So let me give you an example of how the Qur'an picks the perfect form, okay? Now we know that throughout the Qur'an, Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about al-hayat al-dunya, al-hayat al-akhirah, or al-akhirah, or al-dunya, and so on and so forth, right? وَإِنَّ الْآخِرَةِ So he's talking about al-hayat al-akhirah. But there's only one place in the Qur'an where Allah Azza wa Jal says al-hayawan, okay? How many of you know what the word haywan means? Hayawan. Now we know many times this is used also to refer to animals and so forth, right? But it actually means life. Al-hayawan means life. So Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَمَا هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا Listen to it carefully. That Allah said that this hayat, the worldly life, the life that is closer to you, that you're living in, a dunya, إِلَّا لَهُونْ وَلَعِبْ It's nothing more than amusement and diversions. Okay? 
It's amusement because you happen to have your car within it, you happen to have your house within it, you happen to have marriage, you happen to have children. It's so eventful, there's all these occurrences that happen and there's all these things that are constantly happening, you know? Hayat is happening and some people, their hayat is more happening than other people, right? And that's why people get jealous of other people. They say, look at that person, his life is so eventful, he did this, he did that. And nowadays we see it on Facebook, Twitter, and all these places, so we start to even meet, feel more, you know, uh, sometimes jealous of the fact that other people's lives happen to be so eventful, right? They're doing this and they're doing all these different things, right? But, and that's what Allah is saying. This hayat is lahun wa la'ib. It happens to be eventful, it happens to have amu- amusement, it happens to have diversions. But Allah wants to tell you that the hereafter is even further and more eventful. It's even more amusing. It's even more greater. It's even more occupying. There's so much more within this hereafter that you'll never be able to find all of that within this world. Okay? So how does he say that? How does he say that? Now we come to the word choice. Throughout the Quran, Allah has been using the word al-hayat, 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 al-hayat. But now Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ And the hereafter, that is the one who, which happens to be al-hayawan. That is the one that truly is the lively life. Because they say in Arabic, any word that comes on the form of fa'alan, like hayawan, any word that comes on this form, like fayadan, for example, a flood, you know, a flood comes, it's very eventful, you know? All these things are being pulled out of the, the ground and uprooted and houses sometimes coming off and all the, It's very eventful. So they call the Arabs, they have a very, very unique way of picking words. Even the forms, they look at the form and the meaning, that the implied meaning within the form. So they say fayadan, right? The floods in that way, because it's very eventful. So Allah says, this hereafter, however, it is al-hayawan. So the perfect word in the perfect place. Why? Because in this place, Allah is establishing that this life is eventful. So you shouldn't forget that the hereafter is further eventful and further lively, right? So this is just one example of how Allah Azza wa Jal picks the perfect word in the perfect way. Now, one may say, isn't that possible? Isn't that within the capacity of also other people as well? It is. It is. This is the point. It is within the capacity of other people. But it is not within the capacity that every single instrument that is used, I'm only showing you one thing here, every single instrument that's used, every single word that is placed, happens to be just perfect. And that's why we have an entire art within the Arabic language called Al-Naqd Al-Adabi, Arabic Literary Criticism, right? What does that mean, literary criticism? It means that there happens to be literature, and there are people who happen to be critics of this literature, so they will go and look through every single passage that early authors, late authors, uh, previous generations, even pre-Islamic poets have given, and they will criticize, they'll say, he could have used this word and it would have been better. He could have done this, he could have moved this letter this way, it would have been better, and so on and so forth. But no one is successfully been able to criticize the Nas Qur'ani, because every single time you criticize, you look deeper and you find a reason why Allah Azza wa Jalla had picked this way in that specific place, right? So that's an example of the word choice, the form choice. Then an example of the word choice. Okay? An example of the word choice. لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal says, Surely we have revealed to you a kitab, a book. فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ in this book happens to be your dhikr, okay? It happens to be your dhikr. Now, of course, we all do dhikr all the time after salah, before salah, we do dhikr when we're walking, inshaAllah, we're people of dhikr, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, right? So, we know a little bit of what the word dhikr means, right? But in essence, the word dhikr has multiple different meanings, okay? The first meaning of the word dhikr is which is known to all of us, and that is the dhikr that we do with our tongues. We mention things, right? So we mention different adhkar, right? Another meaning of the word dhikr is mentioning something or remembering something with your heart. So you mention something with your tongue and then you remember it also with your heart as well. Then another meaning of the word dhikr is a reminder itself, tadkir, to remind someone else. 
Another meaning of the word dhikr happens to be fame, reputation, and being remembered. So you're reminded, and you're reminded, and you are remembered as well. Another meaning of the word dhikr happens to be honor and glory as well. These are the five odd meanings that can be found scattered across the dictionaries uh, in terms of what the word dhikr means. Okay. So we look at this word verse. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. We have revealed to you a book. Fihi dhikrukum, inside of it happens to be your dhikr. Now when we look deeper, Allah Azza wa Jal, He could mean, uh, it happens to have your mention, it could mean, it happens to have your mention by the heart, it, it could mean, it happens to be a reminder, it could mean, it happens to be a, a way for fame and reputation and being remembered, it happens to be something you can gain honor from, right? But if we look at it, from another perspective, a deeper perspective, we find that in this case, Allah Azza wa Jal means all five of these meanings and not one specific meaning at one time. And not only that, within this word dhikr, in the way Allah has placed it, Allah Azza wa Jal is giving you an entire system. He's describing an entire system. How so? Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, Fihi dhikrukum, within that happens to be your mention, i.e. if you want to do dhikr, then the Quran is going to be the best place for you to find your dhikr. Okay? If you want to be reminded by your heart, if you want your heart to be moved, if you want your heart to be reminded, then what's going to be what's going to be reminding your heart? That happens to be also the dhikr, right? Generally, when your heart start to, starts to move, now you want to be among those people who have been given the tadkir. فَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَى تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Remind, for verily the reminder helps the believers. So when your heart is moved, then you will gain this reminder that moves the believers. And once you are finally moved, that's when you will be elevated, and that's when you will be honored. And when you are honored, when you are elevated rather, that is when you will gain your remembrance within the land, and that is when you will gain the reputation within the land. So all of those things are connected, and every single meaning is meant by Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. Right? So it's as if Allah is giving you a formula, picking the... Now, Allah could mean dhikr, meaning you should remember the Qur'an. So there could be another word used for that. Allah could mean honor, there could be a sharaf. He could use the word sharaf, it could mean reputation, sleet. Allah Azza wa Jal could use another word for... Tadkir uh, as well. So if he said Tadkir, it wouldn't have all the other meanings, right? So Allah Azza wa Jal used now the perfect word and also used the perfect form as well. Two examples, right? And in terms of the perfect sentence structure, I'm not going to give you that. I'm going to refer you back to the lecture of Surah Al Kawthar that I did, okay? Because in Surah Al Kawthar, I explained the, the sentence structure of. Uh, Surah al kawthar completely Because I want to move on to the other forms of miracles Within the Quran as well Okay So this is the linguistic miracle within the Quran Then there happens to be The legislative or theological miracle within the Quran Now if we look at the entire theological system Or uh, the entire legislative system The sharia and the aqidah We'll find the entire system Actually happens to be a miracle on its own But to study the complete miraculous nature of the system that requires a separate lecture altogether. I'm going to give you one example, okay? One example. One example is this, okay? We know that that modern type of research that we do, whether that be psychological research, whether that be research, uh, lab research, and other forms of research, we know that all of these, they don't just use one person to try to come to a conclusion. They use a plethora of different specimens, okay? So if they're trying to look for the means to decrease depression, they will look at hundreds of people and sometimes thousands of people and also from different classes and different types of religions and, and all sorts of things, right? Okay. So similarly, when they're looking at a type of medical whether medicine, whether it works or not, they will try to apply it on a, uh, a number of different specimens and, and then they will finally come to their conclusions and they'll present even that with much care, right? This is how the modern methodological uh, research is done, right? However, in the past, research was done, not done in this way. We didn't have specimens looking at, especially within the Arabian society to whom the Prophet ﷺ was sent. You know, things were not so intricate and detailed and, and research hadn't gotten to that level. Paper wasn't even there for people to write down results of research in that uh, sort of way, right? But despite all of that, Allah Azza wa Jal gives us a remedy in the Qur'an for something that we 
experience within this society uh, in many many different cases okay and that is the case of sadness and depression okay sorrow and grief and, and depression and so on and so forth okay now we know that grief and sorrow doesn't necessarily have one solution but maybe a host of different solutions can work but we also know that some solutions have been prescribed by within the Quran itself okay one of those solutions that are prescribed in the Quran is your belief in Allah but in the correct way what's the correct way Allah Azza wa Jal tells us of this in the Quran when Allah says ما أصاب من مصيبة في الأرض ولا في أنفسكم إلا في كتاب من قبل أن نبرأها. There's no musiba that occurs to you within your the land or within yourselves, except that it happens to be within a book prior to the manifestation of that musiba, the calamity that occurred within your lives. Okay, so Allah is telling you that there happens to be something called divine decree, and we know that divine decree is in fact. One of the ways we believe in Allah Azza wa Jal, right? One of the keys, one of the uh, pillars of our belief in Allah Azza wa Jal happens to be the belief that Allah Azza wa Jal has decreed everything, right? رُفِعَتِ الْأَقْلَامُ وَجَفَّتِ الصُّحُفِ That the pens have been raised and the scrolls are dried, as the Prophet ﷺ said. Okay, so everything has been written down and there is ev- everything happens to be within a book. Allah Azza wa Jal says, "Inna dalika ala Allahi yasir." Writing all of this down happens to be very simple for Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. It's nothing hard for Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. Now He gives you the reason of why Allah had placed divine decree, and Allah had told you of that. He could have left left us, not knowing of the fact that there happens to be divine decree, but Allah Azza wa Jal told us of that, and He said, "There's a reason for that." لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا آتَاكُمْ وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ كُلَّ مُخْتَارٍ فَخُورٍ So that you don't end up becoming sad and grieved, aggrieved, and you don't end up becoming depressed and so in sorrow. That is the reason why Allah Azza wa Jal has told you of something called divine decree, that Allah Azza wa Jal has placed everything in a scroll prior to the occurrence of it when it happens within this world, right? Why is that? Because when you know that there's someone else in charge making sure that everything is happening correctly, then immediately you don't. You, the pressure gets lifted. This happens also when, this happens also within a micro level within our own lives as well. Many of you might own companies or something of that nature. You know that the top guy in every company is the one who happens to have the headache of the entire company. Even if he happens to have the best salary, people look at him, they say, Subhanallah, he's living such a luxurious life, but the money is not allowing him to live in luxury. Because he's got the headache of the entire company behind him, right? Everybody else, they get themselves the salary, they go home after that, and they don't have to worry about it, right? So, Allah Azza wa Jal tells you that I've placed the system in this way of the world as well, so you don't have to go through grief. Now when we look at modern research, we find that it reveals that the chances of people who have a belief in a supreme power, meaning someone who's controlling everything, becomes, uh, for them to become depressed is a lot less, is infinitely less, okay? And the chances for them to recover from depression, if they happen to be within it, are also uh, a lot uh, more as well, okay? So the char- chances of depression occurring are a lot less, and the chances of it uh, recovery are also a lot more as well. And I'm not going to quote any research, it's very simple to Google this, because there's a lot, literally, there is uh, you know hundreds of papers written on this particular subject, so you can go and, and Google search it, you'll find it immediately, okay? The last thing that I want to discuss, or the second last, depending on how much time we have. Huh? 20 minutes? Okay, bismillah. طيب. So then I'll go for both of the things, okay? The last two things that are, the last two forms of the miracles of the Quran. Now there's many different types of miracles. Some of them are a little bit contested. Everything that I've mentioned prior to this happens to be not at all contested, okay? The scientific miracle of the Quran. The scientific miracle of the Qur'an. What does that even mean? Now, firstly, I want to say a disclaim. There are a number of scholars in, in the recent days specifically, who are coming out and they're denying the idea of a scientific miracle within the Qur'an. Okay? They're saying that the Qur'an happens to be a miracle within its legislative power. It happens to be a miracle within its 
uh, belief perhaps, it happens to be a miracle in other ways, but there is no such thing as a scientific miracle. Now I can confidently say that this is not a new claim, okay? And I can confidently say that in the past also there happened to be many scholars who used to believe that there are in fact scientific miracles. Why can I confidently claim this? The reason for that is because this is my field of specialization. You know, Quranic studies. That's what I study and that's what I've dedicated my life to. So considering that, uh, if we look at history, we find many, many scholars who used to claim, who used to actually accept the idea of, uh, of Quranic miracles, okay? Or at least something called tafsir ilmi, scientific tafsir, okay? But they said that, including Imam al-Ghazali, including Imam al-Razi, including Imam al-Suyuti, including from the later generations, whatever a person has to say about their other opinions, but including Muhammad Abdu, Muhammad Rashid Rida, Mustafa Sadiq al-Rafi'i. I'm not endorsing all the opinions of these individuals, but I'm telling you that these are names that have said this. And most recently, a man who's very famous, tilted right now in the world as well, Muhammad Ratib al-Nabulsi. He came here to Malaysia as well, uh, a couple of months ago. Okay? And uh, he has a 10 volume tafsir that he's printed and I have a copy of it as well very recently a couple of years ago in which he gathered the scientific uh, tafsir of the Quran along with many other angles as well, okay? So I'm just trying to say that there are a lot of scholars who have said and continue to say there is something called scientific tafsir within the Quran, okay? But we cannot get carried away, away and call everything a miracle. That's the clause that we have to make, okay? Because whenever we're doing tafsir, remember we're not using conclusive information, we're using speculative information. I, I'm getting a little bit deep because if you've ever heard the criticism of scientific tafsir, then it will be relevant to what, yourself. If not, then it doesn't matter. Move on to the next point that I'm going to say. Okay? So, if it happens to be conclusive, if the scientific you know, fact happens to be a fact, that's the only time we call it a miracle. So we have a fact which is scientific, and we have an ayah which is completely conclusive as well. Now the response to that, that is given normally, is that there's no such thing as conclusive science. Science by its very nature is not conclusive. So we say that there's another way that the scholars they refer to the scientific miracle as well, and they say that is the mu'jiza tajribiya, the empirical miracle, okay? And whether you want to call it scientific or you want to call it empirical, the semantic difference doesn't matter, the meaning is what matters, okay? So it doesn't matter if you have a problem with the word science, uh, because of the fact that science by its very nature is not conclusive. Uh, it doesn't really matter, why? Because the people who are using the term scientific miracle, they're not using your definition of science, they're using the meaning empirical uh, miracle, okay? So an example of the empirical miracle. And what does that mean? Because one may say, if it's empirical, how can it be a miracle? If it can be physically tried, how can it be a miracle? The miraculous nature of something empirical today, being able to test it empirically, is in the fact that 1400 years ago, it wasn't known to people empirically. Okay? That's where the miracle within science lies. Quote unquote, science. Right? That was, I know, a little bit technical, but it doesn't matter because if you've heard the criticism, you'll understand what I'm trying to respond to over here. Okay? If you haven't, it doesn't matter. Let's go to the miracles themselves. Um, an example, well, I'll give you one example. There are literally dozens of examples and there are books written on the subject that are probably translated in Malay as well and you might even have some of them over here uh, in reality. So there's no need to get into too many examples. But one example of this is when Allah Azza wa Jal says, بَلَا قَادِرِينَ عَلَىٰ أَن نُسَوِّيَ بَنَانَا We are in fact capable of, of making a person's fingertips. Okay? Because... The beginning of these verses goes that أَيَحْسَبُ الْإِنسَانِ أَلَّا نَجْمَعَ عِظَامَهِ Does a man think that we'll never be able to put his bones back together? Okay? So a man may think that he'll never be resurrected on the Day of Judgment. Allah Azza wa Jal says, not only will we be able to put his bones back together, but even beyond the bones we'll do something. And that is, بَلَا قَادِرِينَ عَلَىٰ أَن نُسَوِّيَ بَنَانَا Rather, we're even capable of taking his fingertips and putting them back together in the right way as well. Now, why would Allah Azza wa Jal speak of the fingertips of all angles, right? 
And the obvious answer to that today, it's quite obvious, is because of the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal was referring to the uniqueness of every single person's fingerprints, right? Every single person, and by the way, the uniqueness of the fingerprints was not recognized at that time. At the time of the Prophet wasallam, it was only within the 18th century that a German anatomist by the name of Johann uh, Meyer, he was able to, Meyer, he was able to come to a conclusion and recognize the fact that that fingerprints of every single individual happen to be unique, right? And Allah Azza wa Jal is saying that He'll be able to bring your fingerprints completely back to normal, your fingertips completely back to the way they used to be. You know, if you have a little bit of a scar on your finger, and the scar when it starts to heal, you'll actually physically see, if you've ever had that on your finger, you'll physically see your fingerprints coming back, right? So Allah Azza wa Jal says, we're not only capable of bringing your bones back, we're also going to be able to bring your fingertips back to the way they used to be, right? This is one example of the empirical uh, miracle, or the scientific miracle, if you so please, within, within the Qur'an. Now there's something called also the factual miracle, okay? Fact testing the Qur'an. So, Allah Azza wa Jal may give you, give the Qur'an, give, may give the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam certain facts that are not known to his society at that time, right? And it's only later on that we get to know that these facts are actually facts, okay? And Allah Azza wa Jal actually told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of this as well, when he said, Tilka min anba'il ghaib. These are simply news that I'm giving you of ghaib, of the unseen world. You don't have any information about it. Well, ma kunta ta'lamuha. You don't know about it. Anta, you, wala qawmuka, and your people don't even know about it. Min qabli hadha. Before all of this, none of you happen to know anything of it. Fasbid. But, but when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would bring these facts, the people would say, where did you get this from? Are you just making it up? Because they had no way to verify it. Now at that time, they already know the, knew the Qur'an is miraculous because they were the people who could recognize the linguistic ability of the Qur'an. But later on, Allah Azza wa Jal allowed in every single generation for some of the miracles of the Qur'an to come surface uh, come to life and surface before us so that us people can recognize those miracles of the Quran. An example of that is Allah Azza wa Jal in the story of Fir'aun and Musa gives us, speaks of a man when Fir'aun says, O oh Mala, O oh my leaders, Ma alimtu lakum min ilahin ghayri. I know of no Lord except myself for you. Fa'awqid li ya Haman. So, O oh Haman, ignite the fire for me. Halatini, faj'al li sarhan. Go and basically start to cook up the clay and make a, a, a building for me that is very very long and so on and so forth so I can go really high and then I can see whether there happens to be a ilah of Musa or not right a lord of Musa or not now in the process Allah used the term Haman the Arabs of that time and in fact no one at that time in the entire planet knew who Haman was okay there was not a single person based on the records that we have that knew who Haman was. No one at all. It was only within our time, okay, that a man by the name of, again, this is uh, quite uh, circulated as well, a man by the name of Maurice, Dr. Maurice, he, uh, when he was researching the Quran, he came across the word Haman. So he went to an Egyptologist and he said to them that I came across this word called Haman. Right, he was a specialist in hieroglyphics. So he said to him that this is from established from a text that dates back definitely to the seventh century. So, is it possible uh, for us to find any cross reference within hieroglyphics of the term Haman? Okay. So he said it is impossible for anything from hieroglyphics to be cross referenced to a time that is the 7th century, because in 7th century Arabia and anywhere in the planet, people didn't know hieroglyphics, the language had already died. Okay? So he said, but if you really want to try, you can go look at this dictionary, it, it, it collects all of the titles and the names of people that were found within the hieroglyphics language that was surfaced later on, in our times pretty much, right? So he did so, Dr. Maurice, and lo and behold, he discovered the term Haman within this dictionary. Okay? You didn't know about it, Muhammad? 
neither you or your people as well. So at that time, even the Prophet ﷺ didn't know who Haman was. Like what I mean by that is before Allah Azza wa told the Prophet ﷺ of it, right? So this is an example of a fact in the past that happened to be inaccurate. Now there's also examples of facts which happen to be in the present, i.e. during the time of the Prophet ﷺ himself, right? For example, someone would be uh, doing something and the Prophet ﷺ would get wahi that fulan is doing such and such. There's many examples of this, but I'll go straight to the future, okay? The future, again, we have many, many examples as well. One of the most common and clear examples that all of you know, okay? is the example in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says tabbat yada abi lahabi mutab ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma kasab sayasla naran dhata lahab wa mraatuhu hamalat al-hatab fi jidiha hablun min masad all of you know surah al-masad right so within this surah Allah azza wa jal says and in a very early time Remember that incident that I told you of the Prophet uh, you know, going on top of a mountain and saying, Wasabaha, Ya Sabaha. It was at that time that Allah revealed this particular surah in relation to that. Because Abu Lahab got up and he said, Tabbalaka sa'ira lawmi ya Muhammad. He said, May destruction come to you, O Muhammad, for the rest of the day. Is this why you've gathered us together? Ali Hada Jamatana. Right? So at that moment, the Prophet ﷺ had been given this revelation. In relation to that, the Prophet ﷺ had been given, given this relation, uh, this particular uh, ayat in the surah, Tabbat yada Abi Lahabin wa tab. May the hands of Abu Lahab be destroyed, and may he himself be doomed as well. Now, if Abu Lahab was not doomed, then all he had to do or if Abu Lahab wished to prove the Prophet ﷺ's prophecy in the Qur'an wrong, all he had to do was accept Islam and that would be the end of the prophecy, right? But throughout his life, he continued to remain an enemy of the Prophet ﷺ. And not just that, his wife as well, she continued to also remain an enemy of the Prophet ﷺ and continued to harm the Prophet ﷺ throughout as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمْرَأَتُهُ حَمَّالَةِ الْحَطَبِ His wife is going to be carrying the firewood, right? So she's going to be basically burning as well. فِي جِدِيَا حَبْلٌ مِنْ مَسَدْ And in her, uh, in her neck will also be a, a, a necklace of fire as well. So she will be burnt as well. So this is one example of a miracle in that Allah's Prophet ﷺ was given a prophecy or a fact and it proved true. And there is many, many examples. So for example, the Prophet ﷺ was told before the battle of Badr, الدبر, The people that are coming to fight you in Badr, they will all lose and you will be victorious and then they'll have to turn back and, and go back to their cities. And that's exactly what happened. For example, Allah told the Prophet ﷺ, Allah will protect protect you from the people, they were not able to murder Rasulullah For example, the last Prophet was told in Surah Al-Fatih, لَتَدْخُلُنَّ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامِ You will enter Al-Masjid Al-Haram, and they entered Al-Masjid Al-Haram. All of these could have proven wrong. And these were all revelations that came to the Prophet prior to their occurrences as well. So these are just some angles of the miraculous natures, nature of the Qur'an. And there are in fact, as I said, other angles as well. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the tawfiq to practice, to convey. It is very important for us to get acquainted to this because today we're living in a time where people continuously try to contest the supremacy of the Qur'an. But they fail every single time. But sometimes what happens is people we are human beings, right? When we hear the doubts that are being circulated, at times it may affect our hearts as well, young and old alike. We never know when it is that the iman within us might be, might be taken out. And we never know when the heart which has gone wrong may be able to come back to Allah Azza wa Jal. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the tawfiq, to practice, to convey. And I ask Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal to establish our hearts on faith. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in and uh, we can now inshallah proceed for salah. Jazakumullahu khairan for your patience. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.